Okay, so before we get into uh, slant asymptotes, though, I want to grab, I want to look at just like one more rational function. Okay, so we'll just kind of like jump in here and do do one more. So graph uh, the function. Okay. We'll look at just kind of like one interesting looking one. Because not every kind of rational function that we're going to look at will look exactly like the ones that we had for homework, right? Um, some, some, you know, they, they can kind of alternate, shift around a little bit. All right, so we want to, you know, just be aware of that. And, uh, yeah, so let's take a look at this then. So we'll go through the same kind of thing we do, right? Same thing. We have, like, the domain, for example. We want to identify that domain. Okay. And so let's see here. Let's go to... So, uh, Cassie, what would be our domain for this one? Can you look at it and just tell, or do you want to like go through the um, work? Well, start at negative infinity. Say, so, start at negative infinity. That's right. And then we go to. That's fine. So we can we can set. So we'll set it equal to zero, right? X or minus four. Set it equal to zero, right? We want to look for when our denominator equals zero to make this thing undefined. And so, you know, you can solve this by adding 4 to both sides if you want to here. Squared, square root, and we get plus or minus 2, yeah. right? Okay, so then negative infinity, go what we go to? Negative 2, right, first, yeah, on the number line there. And then union, and then we'll start back at the negative 2 and go to positive 2, very good. Okay, and then 2 to infinity, yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, so again, domain restrictions, you want to look to see for when you divide by 0. when you divide by zero there. Okay, so there's our domain. Good. All right, so now let's try to identify here. Um, what about any sort of whoop, vertical asymptotes? Okay, so let's go to uh, Haley. So Haley, what do you say here? What are the equations going to be for our vertical asymptotes here? Yeah, it's going to be both of them, right? Okay, both of these things make our denominator zero, but do not make our numerator zero, right? So we look to that domain restriction for the vertical asymptotes, all right? And both positive 2 and negative 2 will give us a zero in the denominator, but will not give us a zero in the numerator. Haley, if we got, if, those, if one of those values gave us a zero in the numerator and the denominator, do you remember what would we say that was? What kind of discontinuity is that? Yeah, the whole, exactly right. Yeah. So, but none of those give us zero over zero, so that means they're both vertical asymptotes. So yeah, x equals two, x equals negative two. Those are our vertical asymptotes. Which means we've accounted for both of our vertical asymptotes here. So when we go to like think about trying to find a hole, all right, uh, Celia, do we have any holes here? going to say, you're right, there aren't any, yeah, okay. okay, there are none, we've accounted for our two domain restrictions, remember the vertical asymptotes and holes are both kind of like two different flavors of discontinuities, and since we've already accounted for the two that we've got in the domain as vertical asymptotes, there's none left for them to be a hole, all right, how about uh, zeros, all right, so let's go to... Emily K. What do you say there, Emily? Um, two okay, two zero, negative two zero. So how'd you get that? How do we determine when our function has a zero? Um, oh wait, no, no, no. <coughs> right. So we put the numerator equal to zero. And so what's our what's the x value so they give us a zero? Um, zero. Yeah. So we set that you can set the three x squared equal to zero here. Divide both sides by three, which is still zero and square root both sides is well zero so yeah exactly get the point zero zero is our zero all right um we'll uh then identify the horizontal asymptote here as well all right so let's see um so caleb do we have a horizontal asymptote here uh, yeah. okay and how do we go about finding that what do we need to do here 
Okay, so ratio of the lead coefficients, right? We take the limit as x approaches infinity, okay, of our function here, which is then the 3x squared over x minus 4, so it's the lead coefficients because the degree of the top and the bottom are the same, so it's just 3, okay? Or as a horizontal line equation, you could say y equals 3, right? For that. Okay, good. We'll hold off on finding any additional points. Maybe we'll need them, maybe we won't, but we'll leave some space there. Okay, and let's go about graphing this thing. So, all right, let's see here. I need, so my x values go plus or minus two, negative two there, so, okay. Not too crazy, and the y value is not too high either, so that's good. So, again, vertical asymptotes at 2 and negative 2. So this is a bit strange, right? We've got vertical asymptotes. We've got two of them. All right, so we'll draw those in. So there's my vertical asymptote at x equals 2. By the way, folks, um, I was asked this yesterday in my fifth block class. Um, I, you know, I, I, I think I mentioned this yesterday, too, but I, you know, I, I label for my vertical asymptotes, my horizontal asymptotes, okay? If the directions don't specify to label them, you don't need to label them like I am, okay? But the reason why I do it is because the last time I taught pre-calculus, which was um, a couple years ago, I want to say, um, the CRESS, or I guess now it's called the benchmark or whatever, um, it had a question like this on it, and the directions specified for you to label things. So. Just, you know, make sure you read the directions carefully. If the directions say label all vertical asymptotes, horizontal asymptotes, or, you know, <coughs> holes or something like that, do that, right? And if it doesn't say that, then you don't need to, right? So, um, as long as you're answering the, as long, bless you, yes, as long as you're answering the directions, then you're fine. But that's why I label. <coughs> and then uh, vertical asymptote at x equals negative 2 as well. And we have our horizontal asymptote at y equals 3. So let's see, here's a 1, 2, 3. So h, a, y equals 3. <coughs> All right. Bless you. So now comes the interesting part of trying to figure out what the heck this thing looks like. All right, we still have some points. We do have a point there. We have a zero at, well, zero here. So we got this. Okay, zero at zero. All right. So, hmm. Well, again, a good general guideline here to help us try to figure out what this thing looks like is to consider points that are, you know, basically on each side of our vertical asymptotes. Since we have two vertical as or sorry, two vertical asymptotes here, that splits it up into three different places where we should check. So, for example, we should probably try and look at an x value that's to the left of x equals negative 2. So, you know, you could pick something like, um, I don't know, let's do negative 3, for example. So let's find f of negative 3. Okay, and we'll see kind of like where we where we end up there with that point. So let's see here, f of negative three. Well, let's see, it's going to be um, three times nine over nine minus four, so we get uh, twenty-seven over five. Okay, twenty-seven over five, which is like five and two fifths. Okay, so that's a little bit that's a little bit more helpful there, like five and two fifths. So like we're a little bit more than five there. Okay, is the idea there. A little bit more than five. So for this point, at negative three, let's see. So there's three, and that's our um, horizontal asymptote, so four, five, and then two fifths, so just a little bit more. Okay, something like that. 
<coughs> all right, and so then we can kind of assume, all right, well, the point is above the horizontal asymptote, so it's going to look something like that. And for that piece. And then we can do the same thing for our next kind of interval here. Pick an x value between the two vertical asymptotes. We kind of, you know, have um, one point already. We don't kind of, we do have a point there. So maybe I'll try like f of negative 1 and f of 1. Again, just to kind of get an idea exactly of what the shape of this is going to look like. Because I'm not really sure what to do with this point. I mean, maybe, you know, like a parabola. Who knows? We'll see here. So let's see. It'll be a 3 times 1 over 1 minus 4. So let's see, we get 3 over negative 3, which is, ah, negative 1. Well, that's nice. Negative 1, negative 1. Okay. And then we can also, I'll also do f of 1, just to see here. And so, again, we get 3 times 1 over 1 minus 4 again, which is, ah, negative 3 over 3, or 3 over negative 3, which is then negative 1 again. So 1 is also negative 1. All right, so that's pretty clear what the shape of that is going to look like then. <clears throat> okay, so it looks like we're going to kind of do something like that. Okay. So notice the vertex here, right? The vertex here is at zero. It does not go all the way up to that horizontal asymptote, okay, which, you know, something to some keep in mind there, okay? It doesn't have to go up to that horizontal asymptote. Okay. <coughs> um, all right, and then we'll do one more here. Let's do f of one, two. Let's do f of three. Why not? Just to kind of keep it all. And I'm kind of running out of space, so I'll do it right here. Okay. So f of three plugged into our function is going to be three times nine over nine minus four, which is the same thing, twenty-seven over five that we had earlier. So it's again five and two fifths. Okay. So one, two, three. So there's the 3 and the 5 and 2 fifths. I'm going to try and get it roughly at the same height as the last point. And there it is. So, okay, there's our graph. <coughs> Could have left myself a little more space above, but that's okay. There it is. Okay, and of course, we can always check ourselves using our graphing calculators to see how we did. And so if we put that in our graphing calculator and take a look at it there, it's, it's not bad. Okay. Kind of get it. Get the idea there. All right. If you want, you can even have your graphing calculator put in, you know, the um, horizontal asymptote there of 3, right? We know the horizontal asymptote is 3, so we'll just graph the line y equals 3 simultaneously, and you can see it showing up there. There it is. Okay. I put, the calculator doesn't like graphing vertical asymptotes or anything like that. I mean, you, you can't graph vertical lines easily on the calculator, so. But we can kind of see it. So there it is. Okay. Questions on any of that? So again, you can get some funkier looking graphs than what we had for homework when we saw it yesterday, but it, the procedure still kind of follows the same thing, and if you need to, just, you know, put some more points in to figure out what, you know, get a better idea what the shape's going to be. All right. So. Now we've done that, let's talk about slant asymptotes. Okay, let's talk about slant asymptotes. And I think I'm just going to go to another page here. <coughs> okay, so so slant asymptotes, right, are kind of the same kind of idea as a horizontal or a vertical asymptote. I think a slant asymptote, you can cross, though. I think you, you like a, a function could potentially cross the slant asymptote, but I think most ones we'll look at will not cross the slant asymptote. Um, anyway, uh, so it's just instead of the asymptote being straight up and down or straight, you know, left and right, straight, like flat, you know, it's going to be well, diagonal, a diagonal kind of asymptote, right? And um, the way we can tell that we have a slant asymptote um, well, actually, does anyone remember? Because I feel like you guys have heard these, seen these before, right? So, does anyone remember when you see a slant asymptote? Okay, all right. Well, they occur. 
specifically when the degree of the numerator okay, is one greater. Oops, I just put a line through my word greater there. One greater than the denominator. Or than the denominator's degree, I guess I'll say. Okay? They occur when the degree of the numerator is one greater, exactly one, greater than the degree of the denominator. Okay? All right, so for example, we're going to do a, we're going to identify the slant asymptote uh, for each function. And then we'll do one graph completely with half the slant asymptote. Okay. So looking at this function, right, is this function even a candidate for a slant asymptote? Yes, right, because why? Yeah, the degree of the numerator is exactly one greater than the degree of the denominator, okay? Since every function that has a slant asymptote requires that the numerator is one degree greater than the denominator, Okay, so let me say that again. Since every function that has a slant asymptote requires that the function has a numerator degree that's one degree greater than the denominator, will a function ever have both a slant asymptote and a horizontal asymptote? Is that possible? A slant asymptote requires that the function has the one degree greater in the numerator than it does in the denominator. So. If a function has a slant asymptote, will it ever have a horizontal asymptote simultaneously? What do we say? <laughs> People are like, I'm going to think my answer, and I'm pretty sure, but I don't want Miss Whitmire to ask me to explain it. So, all right, Ashley, go for it. Um, I'm going to say no. You're going to say no. Okay, why? Because um, some, hor like some horizontal ones, it's like the limit. As x approaches infinity, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, because a higher degree is like. Right, okay, exactly right, right, okay? When you go to take the limit of this thing or anything where the numerator is a greater degree than the denominator, okay, the limit of x approaches infinity of that, that limit does not exist, and therefore there is no horizontal asymptote, right? But we will have a slant asymptote in this case because it's exactly one greater, okay? So you, w you won't have to worry about a horizontal asymptote if you have a slant asymptote won't be there. All right, so let's take a look at this, all right, and see what, what exactly maybe I mean by a slant asymptote. Maybe you guys forgot what those kind of look like. You just want to see one here. So let me type this in and graph it. Right, and there you can kind of see it, a slant asymptote, right? Okay, we've got this kind of like potentially dotted line we could draw in there where, you know, this function doesn't really cross it, nor does this function cross it. <coughs> okay. So we've got one. My my directions here. We're supposed to identify the slant asymptote. That means like kind of like find it. Okay. So we need to come up with the equation of the line. Right. We need this like linear equation that would model that slant asymptote. So and again, I think you guys have seen this before. And I'll just ask: Does anyone remember how we do that? How we find the slant asymptote? equation? Yeah, Caleb? Yes, you do the division, okay? You take this x squared plus 1 over the x minus 1, and you do that division, all right? Just divide it, all right? How can we go about dividing these two things? What could we do? We could use synthetic division. Yeah, that's one. Or we could use long division, okay? It's up to you what you guys want to do, all right? So, uh, Caleb, which one would you prefer to use here, uh, synthetic division or long division? You did long division? Okay, very good. So um, to set this up, right, everyone's favorite here, we're going to have x squared plus 
zero x plus one. Do not forget that placeholder. Okay, remember, the placeholder here, we need that. Otherwise, it's going to mess up the algorithm. It won't work quite right. Okay, so don't forget your placeholder. Okay, those of you doing synthetic division, if you choose to use synthetic division here, what number is going to go in the box? What number goes in the box? One, right? Okay, remember it's the root that goes in the box, so you put the one in, and then we'd have one for the, x, the coefficient of x squared, zero for the coefficient of the x term, because it's not there, and then one for the coefficient of the ones term. Okay? <coughs> so let's do this here. So let's see, we need something that multiplies by x to give us x squared, so that would just be x. x times minus one is minus one x, and again, we're going to subtract that quantity. All right, so again, I don't like to subtract like a quantity like that. I, want, I like to distribute the minus sign, so I'm gonna change this to plus and make it a minus x squared plus one x. So the x squared's now canceled. Zero plus one x is one x. Bring down the plus one. <coughs> okay, what can I multiply x by to give me one x? Well, it's just gonna be a positive one. So one times x is one x. One times minus one is minus one. Again, subtract the quantity. And again, I don't like to subtract the quantity. I like to distribute it, so. I'll switch around the signs there. Those cancel, and then 1 plus 1 is 2. And so I'm left with a remainder of 2, so plus 2 over x minus 1. Okay, is that division there? Or you could choose to do the synthetic division. 1, 1, 1, 1, 2. Okay. Just make sure you're able to read that synthetic division, right? We started with x squared plus zero x plus one, and so when you get your answer, that's a reducing the degree by one. So now this is gonna be one x plus one, and then plus, well now you have the two over the remainder there of x minus one, okay? So alternatively there, it is. Okay, so either way, we've got our, we've got our division done here, but again, where is this linear equation. So Caleb, what do we, what, what's our, what's our slant asymptote from this answer? How do we read that slant asymptote? Do you remember? X plus yeah, x plus one. Okay. You forget the remainder part. You forget the remainder part and you just focus on that. So the slant asymptote is the equation y equals x plus one. Okay. And sure enough, if we go back to our graph here, x plus 1, and we graph it. There it is. Okay, fits in nice and neat there, perfectly. Okay. So there it is. All right. So there's the same asymptote for that one. Let's find the same asymptote of another here. Let's do another one here together. So <coughs> let's do um, f of x equals x squared minus 4x minus 5 all over x minus 3. <clears throat> okay. So let's see here. <clears throat> so Nick Marsico, what do you say there? Should we, you want to use long division here or syntax division? Synthetic. All right, so in the little box for the synthetic division, we're going to put what number? Uh, three. three. Right, okay, and then what are our coefficients going to be here? One, negative four, negative five. Very good. Okay, so we'll kind of go through the procedure here. One times three is three. That gives us negative one. That gives us negative three. Okay, and so then what? how do we read these results, uh, Nick? What will that be? Uh-huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. But again, for our purposes, right, because we're just trying to find that slant asymptote, we throw out the remainder, and so our slant asymptote here is at y equals x minus 1 for that. Okay. <clears throat> 
All right, let me give you guys one to try here. All right, so try this one. <coughs> uh, f of x equals 2x squared minus 5x plus 7 over x minus 2. <coughs> And I, you don't, mm, for slant asymptotes, right, it doesn't always have to be x squared over x. It could be x cubed over x squared or x to the fourth over x cubed, right? The higher the degrees go, the more complex the graphs get, though. So we're, we're going to probably just stick to those. I'm not sure if I assigned one with cube over square in the homework. but So anyway, try that one real quick there, and I'm going to do it too. <coughs> What do you say there, Emily C? What'd you get? Um, I got x y equals 2x minus 1. Yeah, okay, 2x minus 1. There you go, okay, 2x minus 1. Questions on that one? All right, no questions, good. So then, let's do a graph with a slant asymptote, and then we'll be done. Okay, and then we'll stop. Okay. So let's graph the function f of x equal to x squared minus x plus 1 over x minus 1. <coughs> okay. So again, we'll look at the Identify the domain here. Okay, and of course, talk about domain. We talk about the domain restrictions. So, Spencer, are we going to have any domain restrictions here? Okay, so, yep, you're good. Yeah, negative infinity to one. Union, one to infinity. Okay, very good there. Yes, one is our domain restriction. So we want to ignore that. Thank you, sir. All right, how about, uh, let's see here, we've got um, vertical asymptotes. Do we have any of those? Let's go to Baylor. Do we have any vertical asymptotes here? What do you say? Okay, uh, you're saying you're gonna say it's going to happen at 1? So I'm not sure here. I'm going to take a look. I want to see, does that numerator, does the numerator factor Baylor? x minus 1, x minus 1. Uh, if it did that, then it would be a negative 2x there, right? So does it factor? Actually, it doesn't look like it does not factor. So then we don't have to worry about things canceling. So you were right. The vertical asymptote is at 1 there, okay? So it doesn't factor. That's right. It's just we have a vertical asymptote at 1. Okay, good. Thank you. <clears throat> so then, since we only had that one domain restriction at 1, and we took care of it, said it was a vertical asymptote, Okay, are we going to have any uh, holes here? Uh, Matt, what do you say? Are we going to have any holes here then? Yeah, no, right? There's no way for us to get 0 over 0. We already took care of the one value that gets us 0 in the denominator there, and so there are, there are no holes here. Okay, there could be holes, right, in another kind of problem, but in this one there's none. <clears throat> All right, 
let's go to our zeros. <coughs> Alright, so Alyssa, the numerator doesn't factor, but could the numerator still equal zero? No? Okay. So how did you determine that? Yeah. Right, doesn't factor. No. Right, but what other way can we sh should we probably check here to see if this has any solutions? Besides factoring, and we have a quadratic, what else should we use here? Yeah, we should probably check that quadratic formula just to make sure, because we could have some irrational zeros, right, which that would be really mean of me to do that, but we'll see. Let's see. So um, negative b would be positive 1, and then plus or minus uh, the square root of b squared, so it be 1 minus 4 times 1 times one. Okay, and then right at this point, we can kind of stop, right, Alyssa, because what's going to happen in that square root? Yeah, so imaginary, we got no zeros. All right, so yeah, don't give up just because you can't factor the numerator, okay, just because it doesn't factor it, still set it equal to zero and check that quadratic formula. You may have, you know, an irrational uh, value. Of course, then it's like, well, Mr. Widmeyer, how are we supposed to graph irrational numbers? And I'd say, well, you can use your calculator, the decimal. And then you say, well, Mr. Widmeyer, well, we have our calculator for these kind of problems. And I'd say, probably not. So in other words, you probably won't have to worry about irrational zeros. Okay? All right. So let's go to Elizabeth. Elizabeth, do we have a horizontal asymptote here? No. Why not? Yeah, it's a slant asymptote. How can you tell? Yes. The degree on top is one greater than the degree on the bottom. Since we have a slant asymptote, we can't have a horizontal asymptote. All right. And so then how can we go about finding that slant asymptote, Elizabeth? What do we need to do? All right. Synthetic division, what do you want to go into the box right there? One. And then our coefficients here will be what? Yep, good. Okay, we drop that one down. One times one is one. Negative one and one is zero. Zero times one is zero. Plus that one is one. <coughs> okay, so interpret our answer for us here, Elizabeth. What what does this mean? Uh huh. Or one over yeah, one over x. Yeah, uh, x one. minus one. There it is. Okay, of course, we throw out that remainder, right? And so the equation for our slant asymptote is just y equals 1x. Okay, well, that's kind of nice. Pretty easy to graph that. All right, very good. And then again, we'll hold off and check to see here if we need any additional points. We'll kind of hold that space there just in case we do need some additional points here. Okay. <coughs> and so then we will go to our graph. First thing we'll do, put on that vertical asymptote, x equals 1. Okay, so uh, v a x equals 1. Okay. <coughs> we have no holes to graph. We have no zeros to graph. All right, so no points to put down, but we do have this slant asymptote at y equals 1x. And so that means, okay, we're going to graph this thing like it's a line, but we're going to use the dotted line, right, instead of solid line. Dotted line would indicate the asymptote. So 
let's see here, to graph this line, right, it's in slope-intercept form, that's nice. The y-intercept, the b, right, is zero. There's no number there, so it's zero. The slope is one, or one over one. So I'll kind of start here, and then, you know, up one, right one, up one, right one, up one, right one. My graph is not great. Okay, so something like that, and then try and draw a nice dotted line. it like that. Okay, so slant asymptote at y equals 1x, or just x if you want. <clears throat> okay. And now you may be tempted, you may be tempted to say, ah, oh, it's just right here, Mr. Wood, right in there, and then right in there. And, you know, you'd be right sometimes, but sometimes our slant asymptote can also be in here, or sorry, sorry, our curve, not our slant asymptote. Sometimes our curve could be like in here and over then in here, or sometimes it could be here and here, right? So you really do still need to pick some points here. And again, I would pick some points to the left of your vertical asymptote, to the right of your vertical asymptote. So let's just pick um, two here, because that's immediately to the right. So we'll say f of two to get the first piece. And so that's going to be 4 minus 2 plus 1 over 2 minus 1. So if minus 2 is 2, plus 1 is 3. Please make sure you do use correct order of operations there, right? Don't add the 2 and the 1 together and then subtract it from 4. All right? Order of operations. I know that it says addition first, then subtraction, but it's really addition slash subtraction as you go from left to right. Okay? So 4 minus 2, 2, plus 1, 3. And then 2 minus 1 is 1. So we have the point 2, 1, 2, 3. So there's the point. <coughs> All right. And then let's do um, f of 0. Okay, so it'll be 0 minus 0 plus 1 over 0 minus 1, and so we get negative 1. So 0, negative 1. And there's a point. Right. And then we can just use our slant asymptotes to kind of guide us here. Remember that we are graphing functions, so your graph should pass the vertical line test, all right? So none of this like curving back on itself or anything like that, okay? Your graph should pass the vertical line test, okay? Keep that in mind, too. But there it is. It's pretty neat. All right, if we check our graphing calculators just to make sure, we did it right here. x squared minus x plus 1, x minus 1. There's there, there's the graph and calculator's interpretation. And again, we can put in the y equals uh, x2 just to show that slant asymptote. Voila. There it is. Okay. Questions on any of that? All right. Let me get you guys started on your assignment here then.